located on the traditional and ancestral land of the Massachusetts, the original inhabitants of what is now known as Boston and Cambridge. We pay respect to the people of the Massachusetts tribe, past and present, and honor the land itself, which remains sacred to the Massachusetts people. This land and people acknowledgement was prepared by the Harvard University Native American program. I commit to sharing it at all dialogues and other gatherings hosted by the FASHR diversity team and commit to working towards having others share this acknowledgement as well at their meetings and gatherings, regardless of sponsor or host. Now, I think it's safe to say that things have certainly changed since this time last year. And for the most part, they've changed for the better. And although things are better, there's still a need for us to be mindful and intentional about our own physical and emotional limits and a need for us to focus upon our self-care. Thus the addition of a self-care moment to the diversity dialogue series that we host. I hope that all of you who wish to were able to take advantage of today's self-care moment. And I encourage you to adopt this practice into your own meetings, gatherings, and even individually as you go about your work at Harvard. Today's theme, well, the theme for our dialogues this year is talking loud and saying something, progressing from moment to movement. Some of you may remember a song by James Brown that said, talking loud and saying nothing. And as I thought about all of the talk that's been going on about racial justice and social justice, I didn't want us to be guilty of just talking. Because you see, for some organizations, the moment for them has ended, so the talk has ended. The moment for them has ended, so the plan to affect change has ended. The moment has ended, so the openness to introspection and the ability to really listen to what's going on has ended. And I'm hoping that we can avoid this and progress from moment to movement. So what does this mean? It means talking about committing to investing in the work of inclusion, equity, and belonging. Even if there are no protests in the street, we're committed to it. Even if there are no other groups or organizations engaging in this work, we are committed to it. Even if there are no longer concerns about optics or tone deafness, we are committed to it. And it means talking about things that can help us all on our journey, even if they are not the trendy topic that everyone is talking about on the news, on Facebook and other social media. These things will help us on our way from moment to movement. So with that in mind, our dialogue today focuses upon cultural appropriation. And I'm sure many of you have heard this phrase before and you've even heard some examples. Most notable examples are related to sports teams who use Native Americans as mascots, but also have performances at the games by fans who dress as Native Americans. Or fashion designers who use all white models to showcase their new lines that include clothing and the likeness of other peoples and cultures like turbans, saresque, drapes, bindis, and dreadlocks. And in case some believe this is not an issue in higher education, other than in sports, it's also been reported that Asian students in one college and African-American students in yet another college complained that food offerings in the cafeteria amounted to appropriation because they were not authentic dishes and they were not regularly offered. They were only offered on special days. At another college, a student group hired an all white band to play music defined as Afro beats, which sparked multiple debates that resulted in canceling the band, but paying them anyway. People of color at yet another college were offended by non-whites wearing <clears throat> sombreros and ponchos 
on Cinco de Mayo because their celebration did not reflect what that holiday means, but rather more, more or less an opportunity to drink many, many margaritas. Now the pushback often comes that it's not appropriation, it's appreciation or it's inspiration. Well, today's speaker is going to enlighten us with her knowledge on this subject. Chris Keller, the Senior Diversity Talent Acquisition Consultant, I got it all in, Chris, <laughs> um, in FAS Human Resources and member of the FAS Human Resources Diversity Team is going to introduce our speaker, Carolina Castarino. Mm -hmm. And so without any further ado, I'll turn it over to Chris Keller. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Andrea. I'm happy to welcome our speaker today for our November Diversity Dialogue, Carolina Castareno, an enrolled member of the Lapan Apache Tribe of Texas, and also of Mescalero, Apache, and Yaqui descent, is the Executive Director of the American Indian Center of Indiana. She has presented on topics surrounding Indigenous identity and rights, at the National Conference on Race and Ethnicity in Higher Education, NCORE is the acronym, the White Privilege Conference, the Indiana Latino Leadership Conference, and other diversity conferences across the state and country. A doctoral student at FIU in Global and Sociocultural Studies, her graduate work focuses on indigenous communities and academic activism in Latin America. One of her biggest passions is collaborating with other communities of color, and she is dedicated to improving the image and presence of the American Indian Center of Indiana in the community. She is a current member and former board member of the Indiana Kentucky chapter of the American Indian Movement, where her primary concerns are awareness and action for missing and murdered indigenous women, outreach to the indigenous Latino community, and Native American education. Carolina is a writer, activist, student, and mother who is dedicated to social justice, the preservation of native identity, decolonization efforts, and education for and of indigenous peoples of the Americas. Before we welcome Carolina to the stage, we would like to offer you two ways to answer, to ask questions. First, you may place them in the chat. The chat will be monitored, and if a question is in line with a point Carolina just made, we will get it to her and she will answer it in real time. Or if you prefer, you may ask your question directly at the end of Carolina's presentation. We ask that you use the raised hand feature if you will be asking a question directly. Questions from the chat that were not previously answered will be answered at that time as well. So we hope everyone will engage with Carolina in one of these ways. So without further ado, please feel free to welcome Carolina Castorino with a virtual or actual round of applause. Dagote, she eat Carolina, she eat Chichle, Lapai in de, she eat Marscalende, she eat Che Chai. Uh, buenos días, me llamo Carolina, yo soy Lipan Apache y Mascalera Apache del Estado de Texas, de la Familia Nutria del Sol. Uh, good morning, my name is Carolina. I'm Lipan Apache and Mascalero Apache from the Sun Otter Clan. Um, so I actually, I like to do, even though my um, enunciation is terrible, um, I like to do my introductions in um, trilingually because that is the language path of my grandfather. Um, his first language was Apache, second language was Spanish, and third language was English. So um, it's important for me to try to reclaim as much of my language as possible, even though um, I definitely have grown up without it. So we're learning in reverse. Um, uh, yes, I want to thank you, everyone, for having me here. Thank you so much for that introduction. Um, I, it feels a little surreal to be presenting to Harvard. I always um, had a dream of being able to do something like this. Um, so, uh, and I should clarify, like, it's in my introduction, it states about uh, my doctoral studies. I did begin my doctoral studies, but I actually left to be to take this position. So I'm hoping that one day very soon I'll be able to get back into a program. Uh, but I say my work definitely keeps me busy. Um, 
So before I share my screen, so yeah, I just, uh, I'm actually, I've grown up in Indiana my whole life. So I'm what you call an urban Indian because I grew up away from my reservation, away from um, outside of my community. Um, and there's a point in the presentation where I'll talk a little bit about um, urban Indian um, identity and the realities of what we face and what the makeup of our uh, population looks like. Um, and uh, so I also, being that I come from tribes on both sides of the border, um, I have the experience of being um, American Indian as well as Mexican Indian and the experiences that come along with being part of the Chicano community as well. Um, and so that's why one of my passions has always been trying to um, connect indigenous Latinos to their roots as well as informing the public of what it means to be American Indian. Um, and how, um, and how that doesn't end at these arbitrary borders that were created um, by colonizers. So, um, so that kind of frames a little bit of why some of this work I'm gonna be talking about, I am so passionate about. Um, let me, <clears throat> one second. Okay, so I have titled this, I went back and forth about how to title this presentation and I decided to title it Honor Without Dignity is Disrespect, The Effects of Cultural Appropriation on Indigenous Peoples. And the reason I went with that is because something that when we talk about cultural appropriation, um, the word honor gets thrown out quite a bit. Um, <laughs> and I think that um, we need to talk about what honor really means. Um, when we're when we're discussing different cultures and and how the culture that you're supposedly honoring um, actually wishes to be honored, um, and so dignity is a key aspect of that, and this is why we will talk about how cultural appropriation is disrespectful and how it um, negatively impacts Indigenous people. Uh, today's discussion, this is kind of an overview, so we'll talk about what uh, cultural appropriation is, why I am um, talking about this issue. Um, the first part of the presentation, we'll talk about mascotry and racist imagery, because I do think that that is probably one of the bigger categories, um, that comes to mind when we talk about it. Um, and we'll go from there into spiritual appropriation and then identity appropriation and how, um, this impacts us and what our next steps are. So to start, um, and you can see the image is also my background. This is my tribal flag um, for the Lipan Apache tribe of Texas. Um, so what is cultural appropriation? There are so many definitions out there. And uh, what I thought would be more appropriate is to kind of piece together um, what it means to me based on the different definitions that are available. So for me, um, cultural appropriation is the unsanctioned adoption and exploitation of one's cultural intellectual property history, ways of knowing, artifacts, identity, and voice by other groups or individuals. Um, I think that that's really important because sometimes we think about just kind of like the material uh, appropriation, um, whether that is um, artifacts or regalia. Um, but what we don't talk a lot about enough is the how appropriating identity and voice is uh, silencing Indigenous people and how that affects us. Um, and so who am I to discuss this topic? Well, first and foremost, I'm an indigenous person. So indigenous people definitely have agency. Um, give me one second. Let me make sure there's no background noise on here. Okay, I think that's better. Um, so let me go back. <laughs> Here we go. Okay, so um, yeah, so I'm an enrolled citizen of the Lipan Apache tribe of Texas. Um, I'm also of Mescalero and Yaqui descent, um, and that is from my ancestors who were born on the Mexican side of the border. Um, I have been an indigenous activist much longer than I've even been doing um, the community work that I do now. Uh, this is just something that at a very young age, I felt compelled to learn about, speak about, um, be passionate about. Um, and for me, I believe it's an ancestral duty. And when I say ancestral duty, I mean, it is a duty that I have to my ancestors, but it's also a duty that I have um, 
being that I will be an ancestor one day as well. And the legacy I want to leave behind is that we, um, is that I was not silenced and that I was able to stand up uh, for what I believe in, um, despite all the obstacles. And I want to encourage future generations to do so as well. Um, and this is just kind of like a little um, collage of uh, me at different protests um, on the far left. This is uh, with one of our actually elders from the community who walked on a couple of years ago, um, Teresa Webb. And this was us protesting at the circle in Indianapolis um, to abolish Columbus Day, which um, the great, the, the, and this was, I believe this was in 2013. Um, so it's amazing that um, as of last year, Indianapolis has decided, um, they haven't officially abolished Columbus Day, but they do recognize Indigenous Peoples Day. So it's great to know that um, that work wasn't in vain, even though many people like to think that um, protesting doesn't get you anywhere. Um, and at the top, that's little me <laughs> in uh, my regalia for a powwow. Um, and on the top right, that's actually myself and my two sons um, protesting the Washington football team when they came to play the Colts. Um, and then at the bottom, this is um, Indigenous Solidarity with Black Lives Matter. And then on the bottom right, this is when we were protesting um, with the issue with the Covington Catholic student who disrespected one of our elders um, uh, at the Washington Monument. So this is the theme that I'm going to bring up um, consistently throughout the presentation, and it's what I call the CIA of cultural appropriation, um, and that is context, intent, and agency. So when we're talking about cultural appropriation, are we divorcing um, an item, a custom, or what have you from its original context? Is the context intact? Um, and usually when we're talking about cultural appropriation, that means it is literally taking um, the meaning out of the object in question. Um, intent, because so many people, like I said, what we're gonna hear throughout this is people saying, we're honoring you. Um, so the, when we're talking about a cultural appropriation, the intent is not for the benefit of the culture being appropriated. Um, and you questions you'll wanna ask yourself are if you think, well, I, my intentions are good here, but it's, have you really asked the person uh, or the cultural group that um, in question how they want to be honored or if this is appropriate. And so if not, then your intent is not for the benefit of those people. And then um, probably the most important is agency. And so with cultural appropriation, we are taking away agency from the people in making these choices. And um, obviously when we talk about mascots, that's gonna be the huge, uh, the huge takeaway because um, these, the groups that are being used, that our imagery is being used for mascots, we have no agency in those decisions. We have not been brought to the table. We have no, we have not been consulted. There are a couple of exceptions. So I will definitely make sure that I point that out. Um, and that's uh, where the appropriation of uh, culture and identity becomes harmful. So um, mascots and imagery, probably the most popular topic. So here we have some of the images um, that are most controversial or have been the most controversial throughout history, the Washington football team, formerly known as Redskins, which we know now, um, well, we've always known, but everyone knows is a racial slur. Um, Chief Wahoo from the Cleveland Indians, um, the Chicago Blackhawks, the Kansas City Chiefs, and the Atlanta Braves. So right here, what I'm going to show you first is a clip uh, from that, it was actually an ad that the National Congress of American Indians put out in 2014. Um, and so this kind of drives home what I'm talking about as far as the question of honor. Um, so I'll play that for you now. Proud, forgotten. I could hear you loudly. Indian. Navajo, Blackfoot, Inuit, and Sioux. Survivor, spiritualist, patriot. Sitting Bull, Hiawatha, and Jim Thorpe. Mother, father, son, daughter, chief. Apache, Pueblo, Choctaw, Chippewa, and Crow. Underserved, 
struggling. Resilient. Squanto, Red Cloud, Tecumseh, and Crazy Horse. Rancher, teacher, doctor, soldier. Seminole, Seneca, Mohawk, and Creek. Mills, Will Rogers, Geronimo. Unyielding, strong, indomitable. Native Americans call themselves many things. The one thing they don't So that is um, a really powerful message that was sent uh, because I think that a lot of the pushback that we've received over the years was that this was just any other type of moniker that could be used interchangeably with Indian, um, uh, Native, and um, or Indigenous people. And so this was a really great message to send to those people saying this is absolutely not a name no matter which nation we come from uh, that we use for ourselves. Um, the next one, uh, this is a quick one as well. So this is uh, just expanding a little bit more um, on uh, the issue with native mascots. So I'm happy to share my perspective on mascots. For me, the bottom line, I think we should just do away with human mascots, period. They're on a spectrum and some are worse than others. Redskins, obviously there's a history, and although there are competing explanations of where that term came from, at least one of the dominant theories is that it came from a bounty placed on native people and scalping them for bounty, leaving them with a red skin. The two most common defenses I hear about using native mascots are that, hey, we think natives are really cool warriors, like Spartans and Trojans and things like that, and so we're honoring them. And the other is, I found a native person who said it doesn't bother them at all, so you should hush. So first of all, remember that the hometown fans, when they put on faux war paint and chicken feather headdresses and things like that, are these guys honoring? or are they just kind of playing Halloween? And I would say that most of the time they're just playing Halloween. Even something like an eagle feather, which has spiritual significance in most tribes is an important sacred item, a bird that flies higher than all others, a way to honor somebody. It used to be that each eagle feather was earned with a military deed or other great deed for the people. Having that kind of turned into show or appropriated, uh, misrepresented, whether it's a Victoria's Secret model or a mascot for a sports team, often rubs people the wrong way. Somehow, we need to have ethics around this and many other issues at the center of our national sports culture because a lot of young people look up to our professional athletes and the teams they play for. And by putting racially divisive things at the center of our national pastime, you are teaching people to appropriate, not to listen to marginalized groups, and to be offensive. With regard to finding a native person who says it doesn't bother them, they're, they're out there. But I don't know if you listen to country music, there's a Gretchen Wilson song, Redneck Woman. I'm a redneck woman, I ain't no high class broad. Does that mean I get to call every white woman I meet redneck woman? And if somebody's offended, say, you have no right to be offended because Gretchen Wilson loves that label. So if you can find a native person who says, red skin doesn't bother me, that doesn't mean you can ignore all the people who say it does. And most native people say it does. Over 100 tribes have passed resolutions formally repudiating the use of native imagery and mascots for sport teams. 
the National Congress of American Indians, which represents all of the federally recognized tribes, has passed a formal resolution repudiating the use of native imagery and mascots. And so it's important that we get the multiple perspectives. The ways we do that is with education, conversations, recruiting and developing a diverse workforce that has men and women, people from all kinds of racial backgrounds and groups, and we can all learn from each other. There are a lot of different ways that we can do this. We have to listen. So another really great message kind of um, putting into perspective um, the effects of what mascotry does to indigenous people. And so we brought up a really great point about people claiming that they know Indians who are not offended. Um, and so there have been several polls um, over the years that have been used to try to discredit uh, those of us who are opposed to Indian mascotry. Um, and so we could talk about some of the discrepancy. Probably the most famous one is the 2004 Annenberg poll that um, people have quoted consistently for years. Um, this poll, the results of this poll claim that 90% of Native Americans were not offended by mascots, specifically the Washington Redskins. Um, this was extremely flawed methodology. The wording of the questions was um, very confusing. Um, and so there's been a lot of analysis over the years about why that was problematic. Um, the other big issue that we saw with the Annenberg poll and the following poll in 2016 is the fact that people who the people conducting this were using um, were we're targeting people who are self-identifying as native. And this is a big problem. Um, we'll go more into the, that on the identity piece, but people who claim to be native or claim to be of native descent, but have actually no connection to a tribal community. They have no um, proof that they are native. They have not grown up in those customs. This is just some family lore um, that, they, that was passed down that they have native ancestry. And people, many of the people like that were able to respond to this poll, and that is going to always skew the data. Um, and with the follow-up poll in 2016 from the Washington Post, um, basically the same. I think it was it was between 80 and 90 percent Native Americans were not offended by the term Redskins. Um, what's interesting about this poll is um, that only 44 percent of the respondents were actual tribal members. Um, the other issues with this poll is that it only had about 500 respondents. Um, so it's not really a great sample size, um, especially when you consider more than half of that uh, were not actually tribal members or citizens. So then in 2020, we have, um, I'll refer to that as the Freiburg poll um, and with Stephanie Freiburg and um, colleagues at the University of Michigan. Um, that result was vastly different. Right. So uh, what and the wording is so important. So if you look, it says Native Americans who frequently engage in tribal or cultural practices of those 67 percent find the name, the Redskins team name offensive. Uh, some other breakdowns of that, um, because, you know, that's a, still a high number, but even higher than that is 70 percent find fans uh, find that fans who wear headdresses are offensive. Uh, Sixty-five percent find uh, fans who use the tomahawk chop offensive, and then seventy-three percent um, find that when the uh, fans or other people are engaging in imitating dances or war hoops, that that is offensive. So what's really good about that is it gives a much broader idea of how this terminology is offensive and and the other acts that come associated with it because it's not just a name it's not just a mascot there are all kinds of behaviors that are um, connected to this mascot tree that creates a bigger uh, social problem um, this is just a list of some of the uh, research that has been done um, of warrior chiefs um, and Indian princesses, the psychological consequences of American Indian mascots, uh, Stephanie Freiberg, um, the, psych the psychosocial effects of Native American mascots, a comprehensive review of empirical research findings. Um, and then there's also a link 
to the um, American Psychological Association and their findings um, and their call to end native mascot tree. So um, these, I just wanted to make sure I shared this because we could talk all day um, about the psychological effects, but that basically what the, the current, the common theme in all of these is that it is very harmful um, to the mental health of indigenous children, indigenous people at large, but that it also affects the psyche of non-indigenous people and how they view Native Americans. Um, and that's really important because that really contributes to the issue of erasure. And it really can um, kind of drives home this sense that the American in the American social conscience, a Native people still exist in the past. Um, and that and that's what this, these findings um, link to mascotry and other negative imagery, because it doesn't uh, portray us as contemporary people of the present who are living and thriving or surviving or barely existing, what have you, um, in this under the same conditions as everyone else. It still puts us in this pastoral kind of, the, or this past tense idea that we're the noble savage on the plains, um, you know, that we all live in teepees and that kind of thing, and that we're not here anymore. So what's the harm? Um, and yes. I'm so sorry to interrupt. We do have a question in the chat related to the mascots. Can I read it oh, for sure. you? Please. Yeah, Thank absolutely. You. Um, so the question is, I'm curious what it, what it looks like for a sports team with an indigenous identity, iconography based mascot to truly do excellent repair work. I wonder about setting the bar far high beyond just changing the name to get rid of the negative attention. Could a team like quote the Chiefs turn the offense into an opportunity to do good by running an active annual land back? campaign, for example, perhaps they could also uh, invite the tribes whose ancestral lands they play on to have a presence on site to do what they feel is most appropriate. Are there any groups that have done things well? What might a truly transformative response look like? As a settler, I believe settler, um, a settler colonial descendant, I don't always know what to advocate for, but I'd like to learn. If I'm going to ask for the best possible outcome, what could it be? Yeah, thank you for that question. That's actually a really great question. Um, so there's this, this comes up often when we um, have discussions with our uh, with the sport sports teams in our different areas. So I, for one, um, you know, met with the Indianapolis Indians last year. Um, they're still dragging their feet, um, still waiting for a follow up on that. Um, but that was a conversation that we had because you know they're they're argument was that, well, we've eliminated the physical mascot and it's actually a bear, um, but the logo still remains. There's a red face depicted right in the middle of the logo. And I'm like, you can just get rid of the name if your mascot's already a bear. And so we talked about what that really looks. If we're really wanting to talk about honoring native people, it's asking the native people in those communities how they want to be honored. And is it um, you know, featuring cultural presentations? Is it featuring artwork from local native artists? Um, is it doing land acknowledgements, but making sure that you have a native person writing that land acknowledgement or giving that land acknowledgement or being consulted? Um, and then talking about tangible ways of reparation, such as land back um, and things like that. So yeah, I mean, there definitely are a slew of people in groups across the country that are working um, on a local, a national basis as well, but on a local basis. Um, and so in some of that, we've seen some success and in others, we're in a standstill, like here in good old Indiana. Um, so I think that, uh, yeah, I mean, really it is a matter of seeking out who in your community is doing this work um, and finding ways to support them directly because it's going to look different. And what's important to understand also about, uh, we talked about agency. So um, the Seminoles, uh, the Florida Seminoles come up quite a bit. The reason why I didn't include them in this is do I, as an indigenous person, find it offensive? I do, yes. Um, but the Seminoles have worked with the university. There has been agency in that. And so that's a conversation. There is a relationship between the university and the tribe. And so that is for them to decide. Um, so that's that keyword agency because they were actually asked. Um, and even when we talk about agency, Notre Dame comes up quite often and people are like, oh, but what about the Fighting Irish? Well. 
Um, I'm not part of the Irish community, so I can't speak for them, but it is understood that there has also been some agency, but also if, you know, there were Irish Catholics who wanted to organize against that, we would absolutely, I would support them uh, because I do think that eliminating um, people as mascots is probably a good idea in general. Um, the issue with indigenous mascotry is that it it takes a race of people um, and reduces us to a stereotype, not even just specific cultures. Um, so yeah, so that's, you know, it's always having the local native community, whether it's the tribes or the urban Indian population. Um, for instance, here in Indiana, we do have tribal presence, but we don't have any uh, reservation land that tribes uh, who are originally from here were actually relocated. So most of the people here were an urban Indian population. Most of the people who are native here come from somewhere else. Um, so the makeup looks a little bit different and in how you would include people in those conversations. We, is that helpful? Can we, do we, you want me to go on? <laughs> That's great, thank you, Carolina. Okay. Okay, um, and so these are some of the real world um, ramifications of native mascotry. And so we have like in the far right corner, um, you know, this uh, this has been replicated in several different ways and it's, um, and it actually came um, what, you know, was, was actualized when there was a protest outside of the Cleveland Indian Stadium and um, a person dressed similarly to the, the character on the right uh, was faced, facing off with a native person. Um, and so it's, you know, kind of putting that into context, like you're literally looking at a native person, does anything about them uh, look like what you, this costume that you have put on. Um, and so on the far left, this is uh, really important because this was actually at a high school football game in Oklahoma. And, and so this is the home team that did not have the uh, racist imagery and mascotry, but how they also engage in the racism um, and harm against native people. And so they created this banner because the opposing team their mascot was the Indians and says, hey, Indians, get ready to leave in a trail of tears round two. At this point, we're taking it beyond, um, you know, sporting events, and we are literally mocking genocide at this point. Um, and this just kind of highlights the issues in our education system. You know, what are we teaching these children? What has been mentioned about trail of tears? Um, why do they feel so nonchalant in bringing up one of the most atrocious moments in history? Um, so that, and, and that's how it's really important to have those discussions at an early age about the harm of uh, cultural appropriation. Um, and so these are just some other examples outside of sporting events. Um, you know, Halloween is always the worst time um, <laughs> because of all the native uh, costumes that are available and um, specifically, um, <laughs> Sorry, my cat decided to join the presentation. Uh, uh, specifically, the sexual, the hypersexualization of Native women, and um, that is very problematic. So these images at the top are from Yandy. They were um, called out. Um, I feel like this is constantly. I feel like it's every year, to be honest. Um, and and how this also contributes to real world problems as far as missing and murdered indigenous women, because as indigenous women, we have we face the highest rates of um, sexual assault. So I believe that the average is um, one in five or one in six um, women have experienced sexual assault to some degree. And with native women, it's one in three. Um, so we have, it, it really is um, a crisis uh, in our community and the hypersexualization of native women, um, such as these images contributes to that because it, um, it puts us in, it, it exotifies us and it puts us in this, um, you know, fantasy category and, and it's dehumanizing. At the bottom, you see images from Coachella where they have these multicolored teepees set up that people can rent and you know camp out in for the music festival and people are wearing headdresses, um, it, which is extremely inappropriate. Headdresses are sacred um, items. They are you know feathers that are, not even all natives wear headdresses. I think that's something really important. Um, that's not part of like the, the style is not something that would be from my culture. Um, and so, and then you have the issue of women wearing headdresses, which is not part of the culture as well. Um, and then on the far right, you have the, which was mentioned in the video, the Victoria's Secret model. Um, I'm not sure what leopard print 
uh, panties has to do with Native American culture. Um, she, so um, it's the whole thing's a mess. Uh, you have like a Navajo squash blossom necklace with what appears to be a Plains Indian mock headdress. Um, it's, it's very confusing and, and very upsetting to see. Um, I'll go ahead and take a moment to pause for a couple of questions. I want to try to keep them as if you have questions to clarify something, and then we'll still have time at the end for more. Carolina, we had a few more questions around mascots. Would, would you like me to read them now or do you want to hold them until the end? That's fine. We could, yeah, okay. we could do a couple. Um, so one, um, I came to understand that K through 12 schools play a vital role in cultural indoctrination, whether it was explicitly expressed or not. Could you offer advice for those of us who are parents, grandparents, or future parents of school age children, how best to talk to our kids, maybe their teachers in the context of their school's existing programs and practices? That's a great question. And that really is um, probably one of the more challenging issues that we see is that this starts at this kind of indoctrination of what native culture is starts at a very young age in elementary. And so um, there are ways to have conversations and gauge, uh, uh, you know, tailor that to your audience. So um, I, I give presentations at schools, um, you know, from I'm not going to give the same speech about Columbus Day, for instance, to um, you know, college freshmen that I'm going to give to second graders because what, you know, people, i that's what are part of the pushback I've seen a lot is people say, well, how can you tell the truth about Columbus Day or Thanksgiving, et cetera, um, to, you know, elementary kids without being gruesome and gory. And the first question is, why are we teaching these myths to begin with? You know, Columbus never set foot on what is known as the continental United States or North America. Um, the first Thanksgiving never happened, period. So the the very basic uh, start is to let's eliminate these myths um, from the conversation. So as parents, um, you know, educating yourselves and there's so many resources out there. Um, there's an indigenous people's history of the United States uh, by Roxanne Dunbar Ortiz. And I believe there is a children's version as well. I'm not sure if it's by the same author, but I will definitely look into that. Um, so that helps you have those conversations with children. I think that advocating at your school board meetings and um, parent teacher conferences or, uh, or PTO meetings, whatever the case is, um, you know, as non-Indigenous people, it does mean a lot to hear, um, you know, from you and saying, we do want actual correct information being taught to our children in school, you know, um, doing the petitions, finding out the people who do the work in your community. So with us, it's we. Um, I'm the director of the American Indian Center. So we offer resources, we offer school presentations and dialogues um, and knowing who is doing that in your community. That can be very tricky. And we'll talk more about that in the identity piece because there are people who self-identify and aren't actually part of the community. Um, and that can be very problematic, but doing your research on who you want to invite into that conversation. Um, and I think I think that's like the real I know that um, sounds very simplistic, but that is really the foundation we need to start from is having people in the community that who aren't necessarily native, um, you know, making this demand, because unfortunately, sometimes our cries for accurate information um, go unheard. But if you're saying, you know, we want our kids to know the real story or we want to at least, uh, like I said, eliminate these myths. Um, you know, let's stop teaching children to make, you know, little paper construction paper uh, Indians and pilgrims at Thanksgiving because that event never actually took place. Um, and that kind of helps, you know, move it forward, I think. I hope that was a good answer. <laughs> that was a great answer, Carolina. Um, I have a question that I received over email. Okay. And it says follows. Some time ago, before Zoom meetings emerged, we were thinking about how we could improve the culture of our face-to-face -face team meetings. And we realized that we had an issue with more people talking at the same time, lack of focused listening. I suggested that we could learn this communication art form art from cultures that have adopted it on a deeper, more mindful level, e.g. from Native Americans, their talking stick concept. You have mentioned African tribes that have similar approaches. This was meant to give a deeper thought to our communication habits and have an opportunity to get inspired and celebrate the culture of the North American tribes that have a lot of old wisdom. 
that we in North America might not even be familiar with. Someone provided feedback saying the idea of using the stick slash object to explain slash understand the idea of respectful communication was a cultural appropriation, although it was going to be obvious that the credit was to be given to Native Americans. I disagreed with that. Let's see, I disagreed with that view. To me, it's a great way to explore and honor the culture I admire and reflect on my own communication habits. What would the actual experts say about this? So that's a great question. Um, and that brings me back to the whole, the CIA. So, um, and the two particular ones, uh, context and agency. So when are we divorcing the object from its context? So not necessarily, um, but, this is part of the problem we get into when people um, say that they are, um, you know, admiring Native culture. Um, which one? <laughs> so, you know, in the United States, we have over 570 uh, federally recognized tribes, over 100 more state recognized tribes. And that's just within the continental United States. When we talk about Indigenous people, we're also talking about First Nations from Canada, um, Indigenous communities from Mexico and Latin America. Um, and so, the, the first, because there is a difference between appropriation and appreciation. Um, and that, again, involves context and agency. Um, so making sure that you are attributing it, you know, did you look up resources on a talking stick um, from a specific tribe or even tribal region? And so attributing it to that is one step. I think also, um, this is a question that came up for me recently about Dia de los Muertos because that's an indigenous holiday as well. Um, and so people were asking me, is it appropriate for me to do an ofrenda, an altar? The answer is taboo. Um, you can make it your own. You can attribute where you get the inspiration from while also making it a cultural, something based on your own custom. So like with the ofrenda idea, you know, I'm telling people, if you're, if you have ancestors from Europe, it wouldn't make sense for you to have, you know, the monarch butterflies, um, these other items um, on your ofrenda that are the marigolds, these things that are indigenous to Mexico um, and to Southwestern natives. Um, but you can have items that help you remember your loved ones. So it's the same kind of thing with the talking stick. Are you using a talking stick and are you designing it in a native fashion? Are you modeling it off of something else that's probably not appropriate? Are you using some other item that's maybe specific for your company, um, has some sort of significance for your group? Um, that's These are questions that you need to ask yourself in that. But again, when attributing um, where you are getting the inspiration from, it's important to make sure that you're being very specific and not just attributing it to native people at large. Um, and so there's going to be varying perspectives on that. There's probably people who say, oh, it's okay, just do it. Um, there's gonna be people who say, don't do it at all. Um, and so I just like for us to pause and ask ourselves those questions. And if we can't answer those authentically and if we don't have um, you know, the right answers for that, then maybe try another practice. Great answer, thank you so much for that information. Great. I think we have um, a couple of other questions in the chat. I wanted to make sure um, people knew that we, we saw them and we have them logged, uh, but we want to make sure Carolina has time to continue our presentation. So we'll save those um, for a little later. Okay, so moving on to a fun one. <laughs> Spiritual appropriation um, is a very big issue. Um, here we have, uh, you know, people cashing in on the shaman, shamanic, I can't even say it, industry. Here's something, I don't know native people who actually use the term shaman. So that's something that's really important to remember when having this discussion. Um, that is still a very Western kind of concept or topic or way of describing holy people, medicine men, etc. cetera. Um, so that's problematic in and of itself. Um, and this has become an issue where it's not only um, stealing, you know, intellectual property, ways of knowing from indigenous people, people are actually profiting off of this. Um, so we'll start with this first clip. I won't play this full video, um, but this is a part of um, a short called White Shaman Plastic Medicine Men um, from 1996 and um, kind of goes into some of these issues. When I went on the mountain,
about me. The creator didn't ask me if I were, was Indian. He didn't ask me if I was white. Um, it heard my call and it answered my call. When I first heard some of the Native American teachings, I just, I remember weeping, talking about all things that being connected, as I understand it, and that what you take, you must give back. There's a lot of people out there getting involved, interested in shamanism, uh, curious about shamanism, uh, and so the idea was to provide some sort of base for the white culture. I, I can treat my products with respect. I can know who the artist is. But if someone buys it that doesn't want to use it respectfully, that's, that's not my responsibility. I'm called to do speaking engagements all over the country on this wisdom. So as, as the person becomes more popular, they can't really do what they want. This is really my love, to be here with these Native American people. And the Church of Loving Hands is a church of natural healing in medicine ways. And our primary tenant is to facilitate individual spiritual expression in all daily activities of life. You can always tell a white person when they give the Indian name. It's always these, these Hollywood type of names, you know, a Rolling Thunder or, or uh, a Swift Deer or... or uh, <laughs> yeah, you can always tell that kind of stuff, and they're always English names, so to speak. Uh, I think that's ridiculous because there's no... they don't know the reason why they have names. They don't have naming ceremonies. Uh, the name come to me when I was writing something about my grandmother. And uh, I kept thinking about other names, other things, and everything. And this little voice said, nope, you are a Winstead. Those people, Brooke Medicine Eagle, Jim Silver Eagle. Why don't they pick up a name like Bloody Gut? Something, you know, that doesn't have that that ring of, of uh, power and spirituality. You know. My name is Skyhawk Oyela. My Anglo-Saxon name is Rosalind. And I'm a Métis medicine woman of Blackfoot and Ojibwa heritage. I got my name on my vision quest, and I felt firm. This is my name. Um, I knew I heard it. It felt right. It resonated in my being. And no one can take that from me. People can mock it if they want. People can you know, do whatever they wish with it. But I feel it in my being, and, and that that describes who I am. But the Indian name comes from a very honored place and a very special, you know, like a family carrying on its tradition through its name. You know. um, those are treated with great respect and honor. We don't just pluck names out of somewhere, you know. So um, <laughs> it always gets me um, watching that uh, whole video. Um, I just wanted to share that first part. Um, so that, <laughs> and that is something that it, it is always some sort of kind of ridiculous sounding name that they clearly gave themselves. And so not understanding what naming ceremonies are, like how you get your name um, in different tribal cultures. Um, again, so that's where we go back to context and you're divorcing the context from the the, the aspect of naming. Um, this isn't something you pick for yourself because it sounds pretty or ethereal. Um, this is something that is very serious and, um, you know, is a sacred moment uh, in many na uh, Native cultures. Um, one of my favorite elders um, who walked on a few years ago is John Trudell, who is Santee Sioux, um, also Chicano as well. Um, and this is a quote, actually, he was quoted in the film uh, documentary Real Engine. Um, and that is 
I feel like this is really important because one of the big questions we have as indigenous people is why, why do they want our culture so badly? Like, what is it about us? And so this is a quote that has stuck with me for years. It says, in a way they were trying to imitate us. In a way they were trying to remember who they were. Every human being is a descendant of a tribe. So these white people, they are descendants of the tribes of Europe. There was a time in their ancestry where they wore feathers and they wore beads and shells. There was a time in their ancestry, all right, before this colonizing mentality came and did to them to turn them into the white people they are. And then it came and did it to us. The very same thing that happened to us happened to them. That quote is so profound to me because it is, it's true. It, throughout history, if we go far back enough, everyone's indigenous to somewhere. Um, you know, the pagans uh, throughout Europe were, um, you know, ostracized and tormented um, by uh, when Christianity came to fruition. And so this is, they have experienced that same thing. So what we're looking at here in the United States is a lot of white people who um, maybe they are falling outside of that Judeo-Christian framework. Maybe the Western way of thinking isn't working for them, but they don't necessarily know what their original culture is. And so they're clinging on to native culture. Um, that explains it, but it doesn't excuse it. And so I try when I'm having authentic conversations with people who, and we go back to intent, their intent is not to harm, but but is your intent for the benefit of indigenous people? Like, is it, what are you doing for indigenous people while you are partaking in our culture? And if the answer is nothing, then we need to talk about how do we find out how you can be in tune with yourself? One of the biggest issues I see is people using white sage um, who are not Native American. Um, and this and this is for everyone because this is people of all cultures, not just white people um, who use sage and it's not from their culture. There are sacred herbs that have the same type of healing, cleansing aspects, um, and there's and there's science behind it. It's not just us being, you know, spiritual and, um, you know, like noble or whatever. There's there is there's science science behind it about ridding the air and your the space of negative energy, negative ions. Um, but there are different herbs and and items that can be used based on where you're from, based on where your ancestors are from. You know, a lot of people from the Caribbean will use Palo Santo. Um, there are different types of herbs that, you know, people who claim that they're witches or Wiccan will try to use sage. But if you're originally from Europe, that's not part of your culture, but there are herbs that you can use. And so encouraging people to do that work, to find out who they are, um, where they come from, I think that can help us to educate people and eliminate some of this um, spiritual kind of um, appropriation. Um, what's also really important, um, and I apologize, I'll make sure I read because I know it's cut off probably at the top, but um, it's important to understand what it means to be Indian, what it means to be American Indian, what it means to be indigenous, and how you can't just pick and choose when you wanna put that on, when you wanna use that spirituality. So here we have people who are making money off of indigenous spirituality. Uh, they are profiting, they are selling vision quests, they are um, you know, charging for sun dances or, or different types of anipi ceremonies, sweat lodges, what have you. Um, they have built a brand for themselves off of appropriating our spirituality. But what's important to understand is what does it really mean to be Indian in the United States? Um, we did not become citizens in our own country until 1924. Um, and then even our suffrage rights weren't enforced until the Voting Rights Act of 1965, when other communities of color, most uh, notably the Black community, received their enforcement of their own suffrage rights. Um, so what, so, you know, like this is something that people who are taking from our culture did not have to experience and they don't have that they burden to carry. As far as religious freedom, uh, we didn't get that right until 1978. Um, so the American Indian Religious Freedom Act of 1978 is what gave us our constitutional right to practice our own spiritual beliefs and customs. Um, it was it wasn't just a matter of it not being enforced. It was outlawed like you could not practice your ceremonies. You could not practice your faith openly and freely until 1978. But even with that, the enforcement was still an issue. There was, there had to be an amendment 
Um, and so many of us know about the Religious Freedom Restoration Act in 1994, written in 1993, I believe passed in 1994. Um, so that was made enforcing the original act, but also prohibiting agencies and different departments from burdening American Indians' right to religious freedom. And one of the, I have an image in the background of peyote, and so my tribe specifically, you know, are known as the keepers of the peyote. That is something that we brought to the northern tribes, um, which there's issues with that being appropriated even from other communities as well. Um, and so uh, it's like a whole other <laughs> story to go there. But um, peyote, because of its hallucinogenic properties, uh, was still being, if you went somewhere for a drug test and you tested positive, for having peyote in your system, you could still be um, in trouble. You could lose, you know, lose benefits, not get the job, potentially be arrested. Um, but that's part of our spiritual freedom. And so that was one of the things, uh, cases were coming up consistently um, surrounding that issue. And so that was one of the aspects of creating the Religious Freedom Restoration Act. So when we think about these policies that affect American Indian identity and the right to be who we are, the right to practice our own culture, um, and then you look at white people or non-native people who are taking from our culture what they want and making a profit off of it. And it's become glamorized where still to this day, many of us are demonized for it. And up until very recently, we're criminalized for it. Um, and that kind of goes to the whole aspect of kill the Indian, save the man, which is the famous quote um, from Colonel Richard Henry Pratt. And I want to share with you the actual full quote on that. A great general has said that the only good Indian is a dead one and that high sanction of his destruction has been an enormous factor in promoting Indian massacres. In a sense, I agree with the sentiment, but only in this, that all the Indian there is in the race should be dead. Kill the Indian in him and save the man. And so here we have images from the boarding school era uh, when the boarding schools first went into effect. And you have the before and after of native children in their traditional garb, the traditional regalia, and um, what they look like after uh, you know, cutting their hair, forcing them into um, Western uh, garb, um, forcing the cr forceful Christianization, uh, taking away their names, punishing them for speaking their languages. Um, it really, in all, as in all sense of the word was killing the indigenous people. Um, and so this is also something is when we, when we talk about people taking from our spirituality, you don't have the burden of this, your ancestors did not survive this. Um, and so, you know, what gives you the right to take the pretty aspects of our culture? Um, these are some other, I thought, important facts to share. So what we know of, of this year with all of the um, excavations being done on these different boarding school and residential school uh, lands um, so far, and this was as of July 2nd, so far, uh, there are seven schools were searched and the bodies of 1,505 children have been found between Canada and the United States. There are still 497 schools to go. That's also not taking into consideration the mission schools in the Southwest and Texas and California. My grandfather was a survivor of the mission schools. Um, as well as, and then we, when we get into Mexico as well, you know, that legacy has a lot longer. So these are actual, our children were being taken from our communities and um, forced into the white or colonizer spirituality and were literally being killed. Um, and then we also have a couple images of uh, as recent as 1952, you could purchase a Native American child for $10. Um, and so the mission, the Catholic orphanages and the different mission schools um, would send these postcards out to people who made donations to their organization and allow them to come and pick up Indian children at their, uh, at their pleasure. Um, which leads us to the importance of ICWA, the Indian Child Welfare Act of 1978. The stated purpose of ICWA is to protect the best interests of Indian children and to promote the stability and security of Indian tribes and families. The act seeks to protect Indian children, tribes, and culture by limiting states' powers and by encouraging respect for tribal authority regarding the placement of Indian youth. The Indian Child Welfare Act played an important role in tribal empowerment and child welfare. What I will tell you, especially living here in Indiana and having to continue to have this conversation um, to stand up for my clients is that this act still 
is not being fully enforced everywhere. And there are still people, especially religious people, who are finding ways to circumnavigate the act and um, try to pressure indigenous people who are struggling into private adoptions. And in many cases that is offering them money or offering them um, some, side of, some sort of solace for them to, because they believe that it is their Christian mission uh, to <laughs> take the heathen out of us still. And so, you know, this is something that in 2021 is still happening today. Um, and I'll pause for reflections here. This is an image of my grandfather. Like I said, he was, uh, and this is one of the missions in San Antonio. Um, my tribe was enslaved by the missions, uh, the Lipan Apache in Texas. Um, and so uh, my grandfather was uh, his entire life a devoted heathen, uh, so to speak, um, and maintained his um, traditions, traditional culture. Um, so he's one of my personal heroes, but uh, I'll pause for some questions. And also, we'd like to invite everyone at this time to uh, place in the chat one word that describes how you're feeling right now, because we know that for some of you, this information may be challenging your way of thinking more than you've ever imagined it could. Um, others may be inspired, others may feel differently. So if you need to uh, share that information or you wish to share it, uh, this is your opportunity as well to put in the chat one word that maybe you're, that may reflect how you're feeling right now. Thank you to everyone who's who's already sharing. We have a lot of responses ranging from shocked, enraged, sick to my stomach, um, moved, better informed, saddened, angry, enlightened. Um, so yeah, I think people are getting quite a lot out of your presentation, Carolina. Thank you. Thank you so much. I'm glad that it is really resonating with everyone. Thank you. And I think also it's it's important to, to do this as well because sometimes we have these feelings and we think we're the only one. But you can see from the words that are coming that it's you're not alone. Um, you're not the only one that didn't know a lot of these things. Um, you're not the only one who's saddened um, you and or horrified like someone just just wrote in. Um, I also want to add to, I, for, I forgot to mention this, that um, something that we also see as kind of modern day spiritual um, abuse is, um, and something that has uh, become a pet project of mine, is the fact that um, people, Native people are struggling at a very high rate from addiction and alcoholism. And oftentimes, uh, the only options that are available for recovery are faith-based. Um, and that is something that we are challenging here. Uh, we're opening up a recovery cafe that is indigenous um, led and BIPOC, uh, black indigenous people of color focused um, to make space a safe space for people who are seeking recovery options who fall outside of that Judeo-Christian framework um, because that has that is a new um, kind of phenomenon, not really new, but a very popular modern phenomenon uh, where I'm seeing a lot of clients of mine being preyed upon uh, by religious evangelicals who feel that it is their mission to help people struggling with addiction, but in their way. So forcing them to go to church, forcing them to adopt, uh, you know, uh, Christian ways and have a Bible and, um, and it, it's replacing addiction with another addiction. And so it's a way that they are um, still finding ways to kill the Indian and save the man. And so um, that's also something I would encourage people who try to appropriate native spirituality to consider because um, this is something that they can, again, pick and choose when they wanna use it. Uh, and it's a reality that we have to defend every day of our lives. And then if you want, I can go ahead and move on and we can answer questions towards the end. I think that would be wonderful. Thank you. Okay. So now we move on to the interesting part. Uh, <laughs> it's all interesting, but identity appropriation. And so I have an image here of a white family who decided they wanted to play Indian for the day for a wedding, I believe. Um, I don't even know where to begin with that, but... <laughs> 
So a um, couple quick clips. Um, this is an image that this is a video that went viral because it is um, a powwow where there are actually no native people, um, or I think it was a native person who decided to record because it was all white people pretending to be Indian, wearing, you know, made in China type of outfits. And this is something that Oh, here in the Midwest, we deal with a lot. I actually avoid most of the powwows um, because of this, because while sometimes it can be funny um, and entertaining, um, it's also very hurtful and very upsetting. Um, I always make the joke that if you go to a powwow in the Midwest or especially in Indiana, you could uh, set up a booth with uh, selling black hair dye and fake tanner and you'd make a killing uh, <laughs> because that's... Uh, uh, appropriating our aesthetic is a constant part of this culture. Um, so I will show you this. So many levels of offensive. Um, so for context, we'll move on to, here's an actual drum circle at a traditional Lakota tribal powwow. different in that one you actually see <laughs> there's rhythm first of all uh there's rhythm there is um technique being used in the uh, in the drumming as well as the singing um there's cultural significance you know it's i i don't even have words for what the other one is and so um <sighs> this is something that becomes very upsetting and is very prominent in powwow culture here are some uh, famous people who have profited off of pretending to be Indian. Um, and up the top, we have Princess Pale Moon, um, who pretended to have several different native identities, and it was revealed that she was not connected to any tribe. On the far right upper corner, we have um, Iron Eyes Cody, probably one of the most famous pretendians, um, because he uh, was not native at all. He was Sicilian and, you know, definitely used makeup to darken his features um, and created this whole career off of being the crying Indian on the, you know, anti-pollution campaign ads. Um, and he was an Indian. Um, in the lower corner, you have a uh, right corner or left corner, excuse me, you have Andrea Smith um, profiting as a professor and um, promoting that she was an indigenous professor uh, pretending to be Cherokee and it was revealed that she was not. And then in the lower right, you have Ward Churchill, which was also a huge issue um, where he even created fake uh, ID cards uh, for a tribe that doesn't exist. Um, and all of these people have made careers. There are so many more. These are just, I just picked a couple of random ones out of a hat because there are so many out there. There are people who pretend to be 
uh, spiritual leaders. Uh, there are people who take advantage of elders in our community and their need for connection and their need for um, resources because of the poverty that it, you know, that many are enduring in our urban communities as well as the reservations. Um, and there are people who take advantage of that. And so then use that connection to that elder to promote themselves as holy men or medicine men or chiefs or sometimes both, which makes no sense, but you know, there's no logic to it. Um, and, uh, and, and they, they make careers off of this. Um, so they are literally profiting. And so we get to an uncomfortable topic. It's Harvard. We have to talk about Elizabeth Warren. Um, because one of the most famous pretendians <laughs> in the 21st century. Um, this is something that I actually caught a lot of flack for from different people, including other people of color as well. Um, because, you know, people wanted to believe in Elizabeth Warren so deeply. Um, uh, for me personally, she wasn't even progressive enough for me. So, uh, I wasn't on board with her politically, <laughs> let alone the issue that she is a white woman who made a career off of pretending to be native. And there's a lot of conversations back and forth um, about, you know, did she really do it with that intent? So we go back to the CIA, context, intent, agency. Her intent, when she was labeling herself on her registration card for the, bar, the Texas bar, and she labeled her race as American Indian, what was her intent? She knew she wasn't connected to a tribe. She knew she wasn't enrolled. She knew she, she couldn't provide any type of documentation to, um, you know, to establish Indian identity. So what was her intent? Was she doing this for the benefit of indigenous people? Was she going to use her platform for indigenous people? And the answer is no, that never happened. Um, we also know that the fact that she was heralded as a diversity um, or a woman of color hire um, at Harvard. Um, and so that is an issue that we have to talk about and we have to, you know, get really real about because um, that's offensive on so many levels. And there are, there are indigenous people who are white passing. Um, and that still can be problematic. We talk a lot about colorism um, within the black community as well. And so, you know, when uh, people want to say, oh, we're hiring a black woman for this, but they're going with, you know, a light-skinned woman who doesn't um, bear the same kind of social burden that a dark-skinned woman, do woman does. And so it's kind of, it, it, in that same sense, this is the issue we face when um, white people who may or may not have indigenous heritage are being upheld as native people in the community when they don't have that lived experience uh, of racism and all of the other policy effects that we talk about. Um, and so Elizabeth Warren was this really difficult subject for many people to talk about. There were a lot of people who were really happy about a woman running. They felt like they could get behind her more than they could Hillary Clinton uh, for whatever reason. And they thought that, you know, they didn't want this issue of her faking native identity um, to mar you know, that possibility, but the, it, but the issue remains it, people tried to belittle the situation. I know that there were all out Twitter wars on this, where many of us native women on Twitter were raising these concerns, talking about why we were concerned and we were being silenced. We were being ignored. We were being threatened. Um, and it was we had a falling out with all kinds of friends and followers, what have you, because of the fact that we wanted to hold Elizabeth Warren accountable. And I still, um, I don't think that she's done that to this day. This is a topic that could be a, a presentation in and of itself. So I won't um, stay on it too long. I will share, however, on the next page. Um, this is a blog site from a woman. Um, she goes by Polly's granddaughter on Twitter and on her blog site. She is a Cherokee woman. Um, she it goes through the genealogy aspect of, the, of everything. But she also has this particular link right here is from the specific section on her blog site about Elizabeth Warren, where she does break down the genealogy to show she is not a Cherokee person. She is not part of the Cherokee community and the specific instances and how she did benefit from this pretend identity. Um, because a lot of people think, well, she didn't really benefit, but she absolutely did. And she absolutely changed her story. It wasn't something as innocent as family lore being passed down. This was something that was perpetuated by her, that the narrative was being changed by her to, con to, um, be to conveniently suit 
her particular circumstances in any given moment. Um, and so I would definitely defer you to this person because I do think that when a, an identity is being appropriated, people from that community need to be the voices being heard. And since this woman is Cherokee um, and it's her community that was being appropriated, that it's really important to listen to her and to look at the research. And I also, like I titled this page, Using Genealogy, Not DNA Tests. Um, forgive my French, but DNA tests are bullshit. <laughs> That's the nicest way I can put that. Um, I actually have a whole presentation on um, the issues of using DNA tests to determine Indian identity. Um, and I presented it at the Midwestern, um, Midwestern Roots Conference um, through the Indian Historical Society a couple of years ago, because it is, it is so profound. Um, this issue of people thinking that they can take a DNA test and prove that they're Indian. So for starters, the DNA tests, the Ancestry.com and 23andMe and all of these, they advertise and they market these DNA tests as being able to tell you what percentage of an identity you are. That's not what they do. They tell you the percentage of likeliness that you are connected to that identity based on other people who have taken the test. We have seen people who are full blood natives take this test and it'll come back at like 51% or 30% or sometimes zero, or there's people who are, you know, half and it'll come back zero. And like the, the information is not accurate. And why identity for native people has been policed so heavily since the dawn of colonialism that we know, we essentially know what percentage or whatever we are, even though if you're indigenous, you're indigenous. If you're part of your community, you're part of your community. I am a mixed person, but that doesn't necessarily make up my identity because what I was raised with was um, Apache culture, uh, Chicano culture, you know, and it's like even through uh, it, the genealogy aspect has been really fun because on my mother's side, um, we've been able to, that's not, that's not a side we knew about um, really what the culture was. And so through the genealogy aspect, uh, not the DNA test, you know, we were able to find on my mother's side that she's a direct descendant of Robert the Bruce. And so I always joke that I am a princess. I'm just not a, a, a Cherokee one. Um, <laughs> but, you know, that that's doing the grueling work of uh, piecing together, you know, family trees and finding your documentation. The DNA test is not going to do that. And if you do get a DNA test done and it says you have whatever fraction of a percent of Native ancestry, there is not a tribe in the United States um, or elsewhere that is going to take that and, and say, oh, sure, you can be a part of our tribe. That's not how it works. So um, making sure that we are um, understanding who has the authority to talk about um, ancestry and, and what that means and what your responsibility is if you can prove your ancestry. You have a responsibility to that community. There's a saying in Indian country that it's not who you know, it's who knows you back. And so I can guarantee you that if somebody were to go to my tribal chairman, um, uh, which people have done because I'm a controversial person, you know, he knows me and he will say he knows me and, and he'll vouch for me or he might, you know, if he doesn't like what I have to say, he'll give me a call because he has my number, um, you know, so it's, but it is about that. How are you connected? And so this idea that she had one 1,024th uh, Cherokee or native ancestry um, it's not something that flies because if you put that in context with any other cultural or racial group, that's not going to work. <laughs> um, and going along with that, you know, we have this image. So when you're, when you're appropriating indigenous identity, let's talk again about context and agency. You are taking the agency to take that identity, but do we have that agency in our own community? No, we have to deal with issues of blood quantum um, and being able to prove who we are. We have, um, you know, different tribes um, will implement the certificate of uh, degree of Indian blood, the CDIB card. Um, and so it's important to remember that American Indians are the only race of people who have to legally prove their identity in the United States. And that's what I mean about our identity being so policed throughout the centuries that we do know who we are, but there's also a goal there. There's an end goal to try to, in another way, kill the Indian and save the man. Um, because if you continue to do, blood quantum is this double-edged sword, I say. There's a part of me, um, having my enrollment documentation is like, oh, I can use this and silence the pretendians who are trying to take away, who are trying to take my culture and my identity for their own. And so there's, a, there's something comforting in that. But then there's also something ridiculous and colonial about it 
that I have to have a piece of paper saying who I am. Um, and then we get into the issue of federally versus state recognized. I am enrolled with a state recognized tribe. I am descended from a federally recognized tribe, but I can't be enrolled in that tribe because my uh, relative, my grandmother who was a uh, Mescalero Apache was actually born on the Mexican side of the border in an Apache encamp encampment over there. And so even though we're a matriarchal society, we had to go by her husband who is Lipan Apache, which still does not have federal recognition because of the specific relationships with the United States and how our treaties have been done. And that's, again, an entirely separate presentation on its own. But there's also, so there's that issue with once you even prove who you are, what rights are you entitled to based on your tribe's relationship with the United States government? And what other community has to go through that level of hoops? And it's not about oppression Olympics by any means or saying, you know, but it, it, it drives home this idea that American Indian is not solely a race. You know, we're talking about sovereign nations. We are talking about citizenship to those sovereign nations. And we're talking about um, a po being politicized in, a, in a, a way that is vastly different from how other communities are politicized. So talking about that, this goal of trying to eliminate indigenous identity, um, we see in the 20th century, um, that coming to fruition in other ways based on the relocation acts. Um, and the, um, the goal was to eliminate the reservation system. And they were very clear about that. Their idea was to promote to indigenous people, look at these jobs in these other cities. And it wasn't like they picked a city that was close to them. They might go to a tribe, they might go to the Navajo tribe and say, hey, we've got jobs in Chicago and Pittsburgh. And they might go to tribes in the Southeast and say, hey, we've got jobs in Denver and San Francisco because they wanted to make it as impossible um, as they could for those individuals to return home once they realized there really aren't great jobs. There really isn't all this opportunity out here for indigenous people, but now you're stuck here and now you're off of the reservation. And um, to some degree, that was successful. There were tribes that lost their federal recognition as a result of this. Um, there are people who were disenrolled as a result of this. And as of today, this idea that American Indian people all live on reservations, and that's our reality. Today, 78% of all American Indians and Alaskan Natives live off of the reservation with over 70% of us living in urban areas. The overwhelming majority of us are urban Indians as a direct result of these relocation efforts and what we're looking at from early on the blood quantum system. So again, when people are wanting to put on this identity for their own benefit, or they're wanting to claim my great grandmother was a Cherokee princess, which is the most famous trope uh, that we all see. Um, you're not dealing with the actual reality of what it means to be indigenous. You're not carrying the burden of what our ancestors went through. And when I say ancestors, please remember my great, not even my great, my grandfather, was a victim of the mission schools. My great grandfather, not that far removed, uh, refused to surrender to the United States government. So was actively um, you know, fighting against the United States army in his lifetime. Um, that's not that long ago. And when we're talking about the fifties and sixties with these relocation efforts, these people are still alive today. So this is something that is a reality that we are dealing with in 2021 and it's not that far removed because the most popular thing we hear is oh just get over it it's the past it's not the past it is continuing into the future and that brings me to this um, kind of final point that i want to make about appropriating identity and so the and we, and we want to talk about pretending to be indian versus the political reality of being indian so these people who are, you know, putting on this made in China, uh, you know, fake leather regalia, costumes, it's not regalia, um, going to powwows and um, they're going out and they're creating vision quests or they're charging people for vision quests or they're creating American Indian churches or they're going into schools and saying that they're American Indian and they're going to give information that they have absolutely no clue what they're talking about. These people who are choosing when they can put on that identity and when they uh, want to conveniently be part of the, you know, uh, 
traditional American society, I guess you could say, um, they're not dealing with these political uh, realities. And so we look at uh, an image from Standing Rock and you can see it looks like a war zone. Um, you can see people um, in their cities demanding for tribal sovereignty. You look at the Apache women protecting Oak Flat because these are our political realities. And the, uh, and the fact that being American Indian is still politicized um, is something that it, it's not fair. I mean, at a very basic level, it's not fair that people who want to use this identity for their benefit to advance their career, to feel, to eliminate white guilt or to feel better about themselves or to pass on some sort of a culture that they don't belong to, to their children, um, that they are not dealing with the water rights and the land rights. They're not dealing with the missing and murdered indigenous women. Um, they're not dealing with the actual systemic racism that we face each day in this country. And that's why it's important to remember to talk about the CIA of cultural appropriation, context, intent, and agency. And so if what you are doing is not for the benefit of indigenous people, if it is not in the original cultural and specific tribal context of the people you're taking it from, if the indigenous people that you are taking this from had no agency or were not brought to the table in this discussion or this decision-making, then it is cultural appropriation and it is harmful. And we see the ramifications in every area of our lives. This is not just something that we choose to hop on Facebook and complain about. This is something that we face every day. And even as myself, uh, most recently I was going through, I'm purchasing a home for the first time and uh, which I'm so happy and I'm using um, a, a program that is geared towards um, native home ownership, increasing native home ownership. And when I had to go through the um, kind of the homeowners uh, course uh, on the phone and giving information and stated, oh yeah, I'm using this. And I, they asked what your race was. And I said, American Indian. Oh, and the person on the phone, the very first thing they had to say was how they're also Indian. And they don't know what tribe and they don't know how far back. And yeah, but my grandmother was full blood. And I'm like, if your grandmother was full blood, then you would know what your tribe is. But it's little things like that. I'm, I'm like, I, hey, I'm on limited time. I'm trying to get through this process. This is something I need. And it's like little things like that, that people feel like they are entitled to partake in your experience based on some myth that was passed down in their family. Um, and sometimes that seems harmless, but also we just have fatigue from it. I know that I'm not the only one. Indigenous people in general have fatigue from this phenomenon of, you know, again, we go back to what is it about us? And I think a lot of it has to do with that loss of connection from their own tribal ancestry. I think a lot of it has to do with this concept of white guilt and wanting and, and um, alleviating the colonizer's burden. Um, but at the end of the day, you know, you don't face the same realities that we do. Um, and so you don't get to pick the kind of um, nicer aspects of our identity, of our culture, of our spirituality, and not have to deal with the burden um, of what it means to survive under the colonial system and what it means to have to preserve that culture and that spirituality and that identity, because it is an, it is an everyday effort. Every day you, when you are indigenous, you wake up intentionally uh, protecting your identity and your culture from those outside um, and to ensure that it carries on into the next generation. Uh, and, when, and when you have been reduced to being the sole uh, group on the continent, to being the absolute smallest minority of them all. Um, it is a very real threat that the genocide is still ongoing in many forms in our country. And so it is a very real threat of our identity disappearing and we have to be vocal about it. Um, and I will say that, you know, what's interesting um, even on a social media level, um, I'm currently in Facebook jail <laughs> on both of my pages and I had to create a third account. Um, and every single time it is for calling out racism um, or um, some sort of discrimination. Um, every single time I get, uh, I get banned um, from being able to post or comment. And what I have seen, and this happens to a lot of people, but I've seen it happen to so many, so many indigenous people 
um, I, I guarantee if they were to do a study on it, that we would see some uh, very uh, huge disparities in the results based on what our population is and how many people are being um, censored on social media for simply stating truths, for simply repeating facts, um, for trying to correct um, inaccuracies and, and trying to um, challenge racism when we see it. It happens to so many of us. Um, I see people on TikTok constantly getting, um, you know, their their informative videos taken down, and it is so. We have to still contend with this idea that um, our presence really makes the dominant culture uncomfortable, and that's the easiest way to say it: is we make them uncomfortable. Um, the fact that we have survived makes them uncomfortable, and this is why so many people don't feel confident. Um, or comfortable talking about genocide, why most people won't label what has happened to us as genocide. There have been truth and reconciliation forums and, and movements in different areas, in different parts of the world um, for the indigenous people. And the United States is not ready to have that conversation because they still can't say the word genocide. Um, so I just, that's, those are some things I want us to think about um, when people ask, why is cultural appropriation harmful? And it's all of the baggage that people don't pick up when they pick up that identity. So, um, and I'll just leave this with our final reflections. I did include dignity in the title of um, this presentation. And this is a statue of dignity in South Dakota, um, beautiful native statue. And um, I thought that that was appropriate to end on. And I think we have time for questions now. Great. Thank you so much, Carolina. I know the chat has been filled with so many um, comments about how your presentation was so so thoughtful and uh, really moving. Um, so we'll, we'll have some time for questions. Um, I have a couple saved from the chat. Um, and I see uh, Jessica Schroeder has your has her hand raised. Maybe we can uh, jump in there. Hi. Um, thank you, Carolina. That's such a great um, presentation. Um, I grew up uh, partially in Montana. So we had a a year's worth of Native American history in grade school. Um, it's mandated for that state. But um, the most, uh, I think one of the most profound and effective things I'd ever heard about Native American culture was um, in high school, uh, a friend of mine, her father was um, from Tennessee and um, active in the tribes there. And he said that um, originally the terms uh, white man and red man that the Native Americans used, it wasn't, it had nothing to do with skin color. It was that the red men had blood in their veins and the white men clearly didn't because dead things don't and only dead things um, are incapable of compassion. So they, they associated the blood in your veins with life and with compassion um, and that was, um, so profound and effective, and yet I've never, I've never heard that or seen that anywhere else. Um, have you ever heard that? I've heard references to that. I mean, I think that's part of like the folklore that goes along. Like, do we, do any of us really know where the terms originated from? Um, you know, we, I mean, like with red skin, we definitely know where that originated from. That was actually the, you know, collection and, and, and selling of native scalps. I apologize. My email's going off. Um, but, um, I think that you could talk to any different tribal community and everyone's going to have a different story on that as to why those terminologies are used. Um, you know, and I like, I know like in Apache culture, like, uh, what we refer to, like what, how it translates to English is white eye, uh, the white eyes. Um, so it's, yeah, I mean, it's, I'm sure that that's plausible for one group, but it may not be the reality for everyone. Okay, thank you. I'm still going to reference it because I think it's oh, a, it is an a very effective way yeah, to describe that relationship. Um, Carolina, we had a couple people ask in the chat about um, specific terminology um, in terms of uh, Indian versus Native American versus Indigenous um, and what terms are um, most appropriate and uh, respectful to use in conversations. So the best rule of thumb is to always ask the person because we are not a monolith. Um, you know, first and foremost, if we're identifying ourselves to each other and other people, we're always going to talk about our tribal identity first. So in my language, I'm Lipa Ende. 
Um, and what that translates to in English is I'm Apache. Um, broader than that, I would say I'm indigenous. Um, now for me, I tend to use the word native, but not native American. And then I do use the word Indian. I think a lot of people think that that's, um, you know, oh, but you're not Indians. Okay. But it is something that we've kind of like reclaimed for ourselves within our community. Um, and I always joke that I'm a bougie Indian and we use the acronym, we use the letters N D N sometimes, you know, just to be cute. So that's kind of like intercultural, I guess you could say. Um, and so my, I, what I suggest to people is to default to indigenous first indigenous with a capital I, um, because we also need to remember that, um, people from Canada, Mexico, um, and Latin America are indigenous. They're native American as well. They are indigenous to the Americas. Um, you know, borders are a construct that were created by colonizers when they came here. My, my tribe specifically sits on the border. So we have half of our tribal members in Texas and half in Mexico. There are several border tribes that have that reality. Um, it's interesting that we can talk about that with first nations and tribes that are on the U S Canadian border probably because English is the shared language and people can recognize that freely. But then when we talk about indigenous people from Mexico and Latin America, they're like, but they're just Mexicans. And I'm like, well, what do you think we are? Like, um, and, and so that idea of xenophobia comes into play as well. Um, so I think indigenous is a good term. There are people who are going to say they're okay with being labeled American Indian. Um, there are people who are going to say they're not. There are people who are going to say they're okay with being labeled Native American, and there are going to be people who say they're not. So always asking. Um, but yeah, indigenous is just kind of like the, the best term to use. And I mean, that can be broad because there are indigenous groups in other parts of the country, or I mean, other parts of the world. But when we're talking in a US context, that's kind of like the best way to go. Thank you. Yeah. I'll get another comment in the chat uh, that says, I'm a documentary uh, filmmaker and teaching filmmaking in the Department of Art, Film, and Visual Studies. Um, and sh they were wondering if you could share some thoughts about how students might uh, think about respectfully and collaborat collaboratively representing other cultures on film and photography, et cetera. Oh, yeah. I mean, there's a lot um, that we can there's a lot we can learn from students in there. Um, I, what I do love to see is like these new generations. I feel like it's getting a little bit easier um, to have these conversations um, as we go. And whether that's just because, you know, people are becoming more conscious or, you know, the world is expanding due to social media that we can't hide anymore. Um, you know, I, I love to see it. I love to see that students are educating their, um, their elders. So I think that, um, Connecting students again with people, indigenous people who are local is really great. I know that different universities will take the, um, you know, they'll have like a project, like if say if you have Native American studies um, and in that Native American in film might fall into that category or something, there might be a class. Um, having projects, assigning projects for students where they're actually having to work directly with someone from an indigenous community um, as like a service learning project, or if it is even with filmmaking, um, is having a resource of native filmmakers. Um, and, you know, we're seeing great things happen right now, especially with like, um, with native directors and producers and, you know, the success of Res Dogs um, uh, recently. And so there are having a resource of those individuals um, where the students can study their work, where their students can reach out to them. And a lot of these people are actually pretty accessible um, because we have this shared kind of desire to get that information, the accurate information out. Um, even when it comes to um, indigenous people in the local community. So like with my organization, you know, I tell people we don't have a speaking fee. We have a suggested donation amount. Um, and then we also tell people if you, if it's not within your organizations or your school's budget to give us a monetary donation, we have a food pantry. Why don't you get your students to collect, you know, items to donate to our food pantry? Because what's most important is that we are going into those spaces and giving accurate information and avoiding you know, the crazies, grandma Cherokees and, and what have you who want to go into these spaces and charge and then give ridiculous information that has absolutely nothing to do with native culture. Um, we would rather that accurate information is being shared. So we, um, you know, just knowing who those resources are in your local community is really important. And I know that there is a Boston Indian Center as well. Um, so I know that's also a good resource. Thank you so much. Um, Andrea, I know we have uh, closing remarks. Um, 
Sure. Thanks so much, Annie. Um, and we know there are a few more questions that are in the chat, and we'll see if we if Caroline, Carolina is willing to answer them, um, maybe offline for us. But all I can say right now is, wow, um, this was a wonderful, wonderful presentation, Carolina. Um, CIA, that acronym and that process can be used so much in all of the work of inclusion. So I thank you for sharing that with us. Um, you've educated us, challenged for some of us our way of thinking, um, and gave us some thought-provoking knowledge that will help us in this multicultural, multi-ethnic, multi-racial, multi-gendered, multi-generational community called Harvard. And it will also help us in our lives um, and in our own private community. So thank you again so much. Now, we wouldn't be able to offer this type of programming or any other um, programming without the support um, financially and in kind of our FASHR leadership, Dean Claudine Gay, um, Dean Scott Jordan, the FASHR leadership, Gary Cormier, and uh, Kathy Santoro. We thank all of them. Um, the support and input of the FASHR diversity team, Attain Smith, Chris Keller, Lydia Alvita, um, thank you for your support and input. Um, and the FASHR programs team who makes all of this possible behind the scenes. We would not be able to leverage our technology without them. Jess Bone, who is the director of our programs team, um, Annie McGall, and uh, Kat Bliss, thank you so, so much. Um, you made this all possible today. And last but not least, all of you for taking the time to be here because it wouldn't be useful for us to do this without you. And so thank you so much. Thank you for engaging. Thank you for your questions. Thank you for always being supportive and saying what, what you think you're interested in hearing and sharing your perspectives. Now for the remainder of the academic year, our other two dialogues will take place on February 10th and May 12th, 2022. Um, so you can save those dates on your calendars. We'll get back to you with more information on what the topics will be um, and who our speakers will be, et cetera. But again, just thank you all for coming. Thank you, Carolina. Everyone have a fabulous, fabulous day. Have a fabulous week next week. Whatever you celebrate next week, we hope it will be happy, safe, and healthy. Um, and we'll see you next time. Take care. Thank you. Thank you.